Hello, my name is John and this will be a review over the Mattel Intellivision system. Mattel released the Intellivision in 1980 to compete with a very popular at the time Atari 2600 console. This is one of my favorite retro systems and it has a, it had a lot of firsts back in the day and really impacted the gaming industry back in the 80s as well as influenced what gaming is today. So I'm going to dive in and talk about the history of the Intellivision, how it came to be and how it died. Also, we're, I'm going to demonstrate and show you the different consoles, different variations of the system that were released because there's actually quite a few. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to show you some gameplay in the corners so you can kind of get a feel for what gameplay actually looks like for the Intellivision. So thanks for watching, guys. I hope you guys learned a few things. Let's take a closer look. Here is the Model 1 Intellivision. As I mentioned before, it released in 1980. Brief history over Mattel as a company itself. It's been around for, for a long time, still around today. It's a multi-billion dollar company today. It started in 1945 by two guys, Harold Matt Matson and Elliot Hander. What they did, they basically took their two names, Matt and Elliot, and combined it, became Mattel. A decade later, Elliot's wife uh, started the whole Barbie line. She designed it, and Barbie's a huge line for Mattel today. My favorite line, toy line by Mattel was in the 80s when they released He-Man, and he, that obviously spawned a, a TV series and a whole bunch of other memorabilia. So Mattel was huge into the toy market, and so what they decided to do was they saw the success of, of Atari in 1977 when they released the Atari 2600 and how, how popular it was. And they decided to enter the video game market. And so they started a separate division. They called it Mattel Electronics. It started in 1978. They had, had a test market in 1979 in California. And by 1980, they released the Intellivision Model 1, which is this right here. It's a pretty basic design. You have your nice gold plates top and bottom. Uh, it says Intellivision, which is also a combination of two words, Intelligent Television. You have your reset button. Your on off switch right here okay the controllers either people like them or hate them i'm kind of indifferent to be honest with you they're hardwired into the controller or into the console which i'm not a huge fan of because if something happens to the controller you're basically screwed you can't play the game i do like the directional pad it's very unique it's the first controller to have a 16-way directional pad for example the joystick on the atari 2600 you can only move up down left right where this you can move 16 different ways so if you're playing a shooter if you're playing a game where you need to move around a lot, it's awesome because you just basically, you don't even lift your thumb, you just basically move around. And it's very responsive. It, it actually handles really well. If you're playing a platforming game or a game like Pac-Man where you need to move up, down, left, right, it's a little bit more challenging. It's not as responsive. So there's pros and cons to it. You kind of hold the controller like this. This is your action button. You have two on the right side, two on the left side, and this is how you play it. You have this weird looking phone thing. This thing looks like a phone. Uh, I wish it was a phone. It'd be cool to call people on it, but... That wasn't that advanced back then. They had overlays here that you could actually put on it. And if you look carefully, you can see that the buttons are kind of embossed. They actually rise a little bit. And that's why you can fill them. You can push them and for menu options, etc. And some games, actually, you could use them for action buttons as well. Very similar to the ColecoVision, to the Arcadia system as well. And uh, like those two systems, you actually control the controllers would just kind of fit into the actual unit itself. On the side, this is where the games would plug into. There were 125 games total released for the Intellivision, compared to hundreds, if not over a thousand games for the Atari 2600. Games would plug into the side like this. This is what the standard game would look like. This is Pac-Man, for example. Pretty basic as far as uh, title goes, but there were some games like Burger Time, for example, where you showed art to it, so to speak. Diner was an official a sequel to release for Burger Time, and that was only available for the Intellivision. I did a review over that a little while ago, but that's a great game as well. Burger Time is one of my favorite arcade ports. And this game, particular game was released in 1983 by Data East, and it was released during the time of the video game crash of 83. So it didn't sell nearly as well as they hoped. And yet games, you had third-party support as well, like Activision. Still around today. Most of us know Activision today, but they actually released Pitfall. This is a, a version of it. Atari and Coleco also released games for the Intellivision. So that's almost like Nintendo coming out with a Mario game for the 360 or PS3 or, or vice versa. That's really interesting that they would release games for it. On the back, you have your AC adapter, which is actually hardwired into it. Uh, because it's hardwired into it, you only have, you don't have a big brick like you had with the Atari 2600 or even ColecoVision. is a huge brick. You actually just had the wire plug like this. So that's a huge plus. However, the bad thing is if this thing breaks or gets frayed or cuts in half, you're not gonna be able to work, fix the system, unfortunately, and it's probably gonna not be, it's gonna render useless. Here's your RF connection here. So this would plug into your VCR or plug into your TV at the time. You can play it through that, turn it to channel three or channel four. When the Intellivision came out, it retailed for 299 US dollars, and it was packed in with Las Vegas poker and blackjack. 
So you got the system, you got one game and for basically $300. In today's dollars, that's quite a bit of money if you think about it. It's over $820 in today's 2011 dollars. It's quite a bit. It's like, can you imagine dropping that much for a console today? People think you'd be crazy. But they managed to sell over $3 million in televisions in the lifetime of the system, which is a lot. But when you consider that the Atari 2600 had sold over $10 million by 1982, it wasn't nearly as powerful or strong, didn't have as much market share as Atari did. It was far superior as far as graphics and sound to the Atari 2600. In comparison, it could display up to 16 colors on one screen, where the Atari 2600 could only display 8 colors on one, on one screen. That's all, the, the Intellivision also had 1,456 bytes of RAM, where the Atari only had 128 bytes of RAM. So, sniffly more powerful, the sound was also better. You had our K ports, Pac-Man, Pac for example, was far superior than the Atari 2600 version. By 1982, Intellivision was making over $100 million profit. They were very successful. They were rolling. They were hiring people, and it was definitely good times for Mattel and Mattel Electronics. Similar to Atari, Mattel decided to rebrand or rebadge the, the system and sell it off to other, other companies to have them sell it. So what they did was Radio Shack had the Antenna Vision. They had their own version of the system. GTE, Sylvania had their own version. Sears had their own version. And even in Japan, Bandai in 1983 released their own version of Intellivision. So they just basically licensed it out and, and rebranded it and sold it out to uh, other markets. By 1983, however, the video game crash hit and Mattel was the first company out of the video game company. So it went from hiring in 1982 a bunch of people to basically just firing everyone. So let's take, this is, that's the overview over the Model 1. Let's take a closer look at the Model 2. Here is the Model 2 in television, came out in 1982. This is a lot more compact. It's definitely a price-saving model as well. And I actually like, I prefer the design of this one because it doesn't take, it doesn't take as much space. Big difference, some big noticeable differences, obviously the size, the design, you get your on off right here and reset are the same button on the left corner there. You relight that indicating light which is on, which the Model 1 did not have. You have Intellivision 2, Mattel Electronics. There are a number of noticeable difference on the back. You have your RF accessory on the right now, the connector on the right rather than the left. Your AC adapter is actually separated now, you can plug it into the back. So if you lose it, you can get a new one, however, there's this unique wattage and it was hard to find if you lose them back in the day, so that's kind of a bummer. You can also now switch between channel three and channel four, right here. Just like the other model, you can just like the model one, you can plug in the games on the right here. That's where the games would plug into. And the controllers are now different because you actually can take the controllers out, which is a huge plus, so you can replace them. But the just overall design of the controllers are the same. You have your, your adjustable pad here. You have your action buttons, your four action buttons have been changed. The buttons now, the keypad, they're more of a membrane keypad, they're not rised but you can kind of feel the outline of each number. I don't like this as much because if you have an overlay on it, it's kind of hard to know kind of where to go. That's kind of a bummer too. One thing that really hurt Mattel was that in 1981, they announced the release of a new keyboard accessory and peripheral that you could actually add on to the Intellivision. And this would basically turn the Intellivision into a full-fledged computer. You could actually hook up a printer. It had a cassette drive so you can actually save and load ROMs. And one kind of cool feature was the cassette Drive actually had a double feature where it could actually play audio. So when you're playing a game, it could actually play some music as well, which is cool. It was supposed to up the RAM to 64 kilobytes. Unfortunately, due to reliability issues and high costs, it just kept getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. And they always had the coming soon. They'd have advertisements and, and magazines on TV saying coming soon. And it got to the point where the Federal Trade Commission uh, actually filed for false advertising because it had been years and there's still nothing out. And they actually find Mattel ten thousand dollars a day for for false advertising and unfortunately the thing never came to be they released about they made about four thousand of them uh, they did sell some to retail stores so there are four thousand of these these keyboards floating around somewhere and as you can imagine they're very very rare and very expensive only hardcore collectors it's hard to know how many of those are still out there but what's also fascinating is during this time they had Mattel in 81 had a competing division a kind of a secret competing division developing their own keyboard and because they kind of sense that this like, this like high production high cost keyboard wasn't going to work so they had this competing team and they called the project uh, bds which stood for basic development system it was more marketed as an educational system it still had a keyboard they got rid of the the added ram and they called it lucky l-u-c-k-i which stood for low user cost keyboard interface 
instead of the 64 kilobytes of RAM, you only had two kilobytes of RAM added to it. And it had a very basic, basic program. Uh, it was very marginal at best. And it, they actually, by 1982, when it was released in fall, they changed the name from Lucky to Entertainment Computer System. Only less than 12 titles were released for this because by the time this uh, the market, they really wanted more focus on the console rather than the computer market. So by the time it was released in 1982, it pretty much flops. Another big noticeable change is they changed the internal ROM, which was called Ezect, and they changed it in a way where they basically wanted to lock out third party. And by doing this, some games don't necessarily work as well for this particular model, so be aware of that. Now, if I, if I were to choose between a Model 1 or Model 2, if I were to have a recommendation, I'd probably recommend going with the Model 1. Here's the Super Video Arcade. This is the Sears version of the Intellivision. As you can see, it's a drastically different model design. However, it plays the same and works the same as the Model 1. Basically the same length, same height, everything else. It's got the wood, kind of wood grain finish. They market it as Telegames, same thing as the Atari 2600. When they did that, they called that Telegames as well. Here are the controllers. These are not hardwired in. These actually, you can take them out. They actually pull out, which is a huge plus. And basically, same, same design. And just like the Model 1, they're actually raised a little bit, which is nice. Your reset button here, your on off switch is on the right here. Games plug in the side, just like the Model 1 and Model 2. And just like on the back, you have your hardwire power cord as well as your RF. So you hook up to uh, your television or VCR back in the day. Here is the Radio Shack version of the Intellivision called the Tandy Vision 1. You got the Radio Shack logo on the top left corner there as well. And these controllers are also hard ported in, just like the Model 1. This is basically identical to the Model 1. Same size, same layout. You have the dark wood finish here instead of the gold, which I actually prefer. I think it looks a lot more slick. And you have a reset on and off, just the same. And the games, which plug in the same spot, it's identical. And the back is identical as well. I'm going to show you. This is the INTV System 3. This is a little bit more harder to find, a little bit more obscure. And the main difference, as you can see, it's a Model 1, just like the other ones I showed you. It's silver right here instead of gold. And you have this light now added, so when you turn it on, the light will light up, which I think is a nice nice feature to have. And the history between, between the INTV company and Mattel is when the video game crash hit in 1983, as I mentioned before, Mattel was liquidating all their assets. They were trying to get rid of everything. And a former Mattel marketing executive has stepped up. His name was Terry Valesky, and he stepped up and bought all the rights to the Mattel in television. And he started his own company, INTV, and he rebranded it, as, as you can see here, and he sold it through retail and through mail order. And once they were done selling off all the Model 2s and Model 1s that they had, they started making their own, and this was it. And so he actually supported it up until 1991. In fact, a couple of games were released for it after Mattel stopped owning it, and more games were developed for it and stuff. And it wasn't until 1991 when it was discontinued. At that point, Keith uh, Robinson stepped up. He was an television programmer back in the day, and, and he actually and it currently owns the rights to Intellivision, and games have been released like Intellivision Lives for modern day consoles and PCs even to today. Now, attached to this on the right, you're probably wondering what this is right here. This thing plugs into where the games plug into. Let me take it out real quick. This is really cool. This is the Intellivoice. This is the voice synthesis model. It came out in 1982, developed by Mattel, and it's an extension that you hook up on the side of your either Model 1 or Model 2 Intellivision, and the games would just plug in. There's four games made for it, and the games would just plug in on the side. And it was the first console to have human and robotic voices added to it. Now, the Magnavox Odyssey 2 also had a voice modulator attachment released around the same time, same time. But this is cool because this is one of the first. And the voices actually come from the, this unit itself. It doesn't come from the TV as you have the volume here, which is kind of unique. Another really neat attachment peripheral for the Intellivision was the keyboard, which is fairly rare and that you, there was only one game release for that, and it will teach you kind of how to play the piano, which is neat. That's not the only first that the Intellivision has. It was the first system to be really considered a 16-bit console when it comes to microprocessor and, and how that works. It was also the first system to have downloadable games. In 1981, General Instruments and Mattel worked together to release the Play Cable, and that was provided through local cable companies. They would rent it out, so basically you would be able to download games onto the system and play them through download. Only four kilobytes uh, of were total limit, so not many games were developed for it. And when it was pulled off, the cable companies basically took it back, stopped renting them out, and took them back. So no one really owned them, and they're rare because of that reason. 
overall, the Intel version is a really fun console to play. I really had, there's a lot of great exclusives for it, like for Diner. There was He-Man Masters Universe is one of my favorite games for it as well. And Burger Time is great. A lot of great arcade ports. It's a fantastic system. I definitely recommend looking in to get one. They're not that expensive, and it's a great part of gaming history. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon. Take care.